Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the film. For those of you who didn't see the introduction, my name is Aladon Fisher. I'm a climate change campaigner at Naturraam uh, Fundamna, or Friends of the Earth Norway. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to host this uh, panel discussion now after the oil machine. Uh, where I'm joined with uh, an esteemed panel who I'm going to introduce one by one now. Um, people from a diverse set of backgrounds, just like the people we heard from in the film. Um, just before I introduce them, I'll just say there's there's been some breaking news today that's very relevant for our discussion. Um, in uh, the UK, 27 new oil licenses have just been uh, published by the government. While in Norway on Friday, um, the uh, government's expert panel on uh, the climate transition until 2050 produced its report where, among other things, it recommended an end to oil exploration and that uh, Norway uh, make a plan for a transition away from oil and gas by 2050. So very, very relevant things happening in the news for this panel. And I'm very, very glad to be joined by a, uh, a set of speakers who really can get into those questions and also tease out some of the issues that were in the film that we've just seen. Um, so I'll introduce them uh, in no particular order, uh, but we have first uh, Jake Malloy, who is uh, part of the Just Transition team at the RMT Trade Union. He's based in Aberdeen. Jake worked uh, offshore in the oil and gas industry for 17 years before being elected as the General Secretary of the Independent Oil Workers Union in 1997, which then merged with the RMT, uh, where he was a regional organizer with responsibility for all offshore energy activity. And he has, among other things, sat in the Scottish Government's Just Transition Commission. We have also with us uh, Pamela Heyland, who is a researcher at the FAFO Institute for Labour and Social Research in Norway. She has an extensive research background in just transition issues all over the world, from Norway to Nigeria, I think it's fair to say, Camilla, and everything in between. Uh, sticking in Norway, we have uh, Ashle Reimer, who is a national secretary responsible for international issues at the Industry Energy uh, Union, who are a member of the Confederation of Trade Unions, or ELU, which is the largest confederations, uh, confederation of trade unions in Norway. And Ashle is an elected official there, representing uh, many of the people working in the oil, uh, gas and energy sector more generally. We have also with us uh, Elisa Tunström who is Chief of Staff at Manifest, which is a think tank, a progressive left-wing think tank here in uh, Oslo. Uh, she has a background in many, many diverse things, I believe, including the theatre and being a, a tram driver, um, but now works as the Chief of Staff at this think tank, uh, that are very, very important for uh, couples therapy between the environmental and trading movements. And we have with us uh, Gabrielle Jeliskov. Uh, I think I've just completely butchered your name, Gabrielle, so please accept my apologies. Uh, she is a Just Transition campaigner and was co-author of the Our Power Report on Offshore Workers' Demands for a Just Energy Transition that was published by Platform and uh, Friends of Scotland, who are two NGOs in the UK. Before I uh, let our esteemed panel uh, speak and ask them some questions. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to Amaya, who is the impact producer for the oil machine, who's just going to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, and address how those of you watching can participate if you uh, so choose. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us uh, to this panel discussion tonight. Um, I'm here just to answer any questions you may have about hosting your own screening event with your organization or your group free of charge, either in the UK or in Norway. I will also be monitoring the chat for any questions you may have to the panel, and then I will um, send these questions to the panel. If you have a question, please start it with the word question so we know it's not just a comment, but a question to the panelists. Um, also, if you are uh, keen and you're posting on social media, please use the hashtag the oil machine. Um, but any questions, please ask them here in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amaya, for that. Uh, and I hope there will be lots of interesting questions in the chat. But before we get to all of that, I uh, really want to pick our panelists' brains uh, already. So. Uh, I'd actually like to just kind of start by going around the panel and asking them what they thought about the film, maybe if there was a particularly memorable moment or, or anything you'd like to discuss further. 
and particularly hear from uh, our, our Norwegian participants if there's anything in particular uh, that they picked up that's very, very different from Norway compared to Britain, with Britain, of course, and Scotland in particular being the focus of the film. So I'd actually like to start, if I may, uh, with uh, Camilla Hoyland. Uh, Camilla, what were your uh, initial thoughts on the film, and particularly drawing on your experience of just transition from, from Norway and, and indeed all over the world, what kind of uh, similarities and differences uh, stuck out for you? Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed the film, and uh, so uh, I, and I want to thank Amaya for inviting me to this panel and to viewing and engaging in the film. Um, but I I watched it with a particular thought of of, uh, of uh, similarities and differences uh, in Norway and somehow in Nigeria as well. Um, but I think what what strikes me the most in terms of differences is the description of ownership and state role and and the reference to to the Thatcher period uh, and I think it's important when comparing the two countries because in Norway I would claim that the state even though we've gone through liberalization processes and part privatization processes of our, our state company in the 90s, we still have a sense of democratic control over oil and a sense of popular benefit across the country, m more so in the west of Norway, but e even so there's a general sense that the profit from oil benefits a general majority of Norwegians. And I think and, and that's maybe also a question that I, I would like to hear, hear our UK panelists reflect on, if that's their impression too. Uh, so that's, we didn't have Thatcherism basically as, as, as a first point, but also that there are a lot of, of similarities, like when, when Jake is, is being interviewed and talking both about the pioneering uh, time and, and the sense that workers in Norway also describe as being part of something important, a pioneering and something that contributed to development and change. And oil workers that we have talked to has felt that that fundament of their, their job identity has been challenged by, by climate change and suddenly they're part mm -hmm. of a of a, an industry that destroys the planet and, and being challenged in that. Um, yeah, so I hope we can also get more into to details on the premises for just transition. There has been more concrete kind of just transition commission in Scotland, but we have a different institutional setup. So with opportunities also, so yeah. Well, thank you for that, Camilla. I think it's natural then to ask uh, Ashla as a, a representative of uh, the workers in the oil industry. And I believe you're joining us from Stavanger on the west coast of Norway tonight, uh, which Camilla mentioned. Um, I mean, obviously, um, Camilla's mentioned already some of the, the, the kind of key differences. What, what were your impressions of the film uh, and sort of the, the major differences? I, I like, for example, that Camilla mentioned Thatcherism already because uh, I'm from Wales and I've seen what Thatcherism did to uh, the coal industry uh, where most of my family members worked. Um, but Ashla, as a representative for workers in Norway, what was kind of your, your impressions from the film? Well, uh, first of all, I liked the film. I think this was a very good film. I think it's a, good thing, a film for, uh, for thinking. It's good. Um, I represent uh, a lot of oil workers. I'm self an oil old oil worker, been working offshore since 1983 on the Ecofist field and uh, started in there and when the, the, well, I'm not kind of the pioneer, but still it was very much uh, American style of the of the working situation. And I, I think uh, I speak for a lot of our members that uh, uh, is working in the industry is they have been uh, creating a very good work, delivering to the Norwegian community and uh, turn around to be a uh, uh, dirty workers. And I think they feel uh, a very uh, bad for this. Uh, I don't think uh, mm. I represent a lot of um, 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 
environmental uh, deniers, because I think they, everyone, the most of our members see that, but I think they are a part of a revolution to, to change that. So the just transition, mm. will they will see they are a part of that and we have to do it that way. And the film is made, as you know, before the war in Ukraine and now in Gaza, and you can see the, the need for energy. We see the whole Europe is changing and, and, and uh, we can also see the oil workers in, in Norway now is more changing away from, from producing oil to produce gas. And uh, the way they're doing it now is, is changing. And I think, uh, and I feel uh, the film is uh, asking some question that we all need to, to ask ourselves because it's a very good film and uh, spe especially for the youth seeing this, but I don't think they have the whole uh, picture of it. Uh, uh, and uh, as, as um, Camilla said, there's a big difference between how it's been done when we change from the American side, uh, kind of uh, oil production to a kind of Norwegian and taking a state control over the most of the companies. And even though the American companies and British companies is there, and the same the Chinese and everyone is out uh, offshore, they are have to uh, be a part of the Norwegian system to develop oil and gas and mm. now more and more gas. And as I, I think there is... Uh, a lot of more questions than the film uh, asks that we have to discuss for the just transition because I think there's a lot of things to do and I think uh, we, we have to build that uh, just transitions as we said many times and the, the Prime Minister said also on the shoulder of the engineers and the workers who's doing this who know the business and we have to use the money mm -hmm. in the business to make that just transition. I think uh, our members is very clear on that and I work in every day to do that. Yeah, and I think it's a very you made a very good point about the uh, the very very different Norwegian model that we have. And uh, at least, so if I can turn to you, obviously, uh, manifest uh, the think tank has worked, uh, as I mentioned at the start, on uh, couples therapy between, uh, as you've called it, between the uh, well, the, the kind of workers that Ashla represents and environmentalists uh, like myself, I suppose, and, and, and others in, in my organisation. Um, and, and a big part of that has been discussing precisely what is unique about the Norwegian model and kind of what what we want to build uh, the new industries on on the best of the old from and the best of the traditions that are there. Can, can you say a little bit about uh, your impressions of the film, but also you, based on, on on sort of your experiences in Manifest with this uh, couples therapy? Uh, yes, um, my, I can start with the film. So I thought it was. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> it's nice to see that that is. Um, yeah, well, but it's a global problem, so the situation is quite similar, I guess. But we understand the situation similar, also. That's good to see that we can have a common ground for discussing. So I thought that was quite interesting, uh, and um, also uh, the ownership of the old companies. I thought that was yeah, as Camilla also said and. And has been mentioned that this it's a very different situation uh, than from Norway, where we have democratic, democratic control over um, the like with Equinor and um, and the state is a huge owner of a lot of industry. But we also have a problem here, and I just want to say this because what we see is that yes, it it is under democratic control, but uh, the problem is still the mandate of the company. So it's still profit mm. that is like uh, is the mandate and then the democratic control is not put to use because it's um, it doesn't the state hasn't gotten like a, a toolbox for for making the green shift i guess or that's what i think but so it's a very odd thing to have <laughs> democratic control and still couldn't like make the green shift because of profit and it's also necessary for our society as it is today because we need green, green industry or we need industry to to have our welfare society uh, so in but in the couples therapy so we have what we have done is that we worked with um we made this started with this book you can see the the helmets here the bike helmet and the industry helmet <laughs> um, and in this, <laughs> so in this book, Atle uh, from the um, 
industrial unions and uh, Anja from the climate movement talk together about how can we find common ground. And then after that, we we tried to, we went on a trip with the climate, some representative from the climate movement and from the industrial unions. And we went to visit the industry in Norway and talk about what what is happening out there. How, you, how do you see the green shift now? Is it is it only empty words? What do you need for this to be a real um, green industrial shift? So that was what we, we, we went everywhere, like uh, into the, uh, the like the coast of Norway, and it was a very interesting uh, trip to start this dialogue. And then we got the ten commandments for green industry. So, but what we see, sorry, I, I will, yeah, okay, I can stop there. But <laughs> I just want to say one more no, important that's... thing about. <laughs> no, that's great. And just to just to explain to a British audience, the Ten Commandments um, is a. Uh, um, oh has a long history in Norway. There were 10 commandments to set up yeah. the oil industry, which was how the state would lead the oil industry in Norway through staff oil and other things. Uh, and uh, and uh, Elisa's organization has set up a new 10 commandments for the new industries that will be set up after oil. So um, that isn't a, a kind of, a, well, it is a biblical reference, but it doesn't have that much to do with the Bible. Um, no. I think we'll, we'll, we'll head then to, I'm sorry if I cut you off there, uh, Elisa, I'll just move on to um, uh, Gabrielle. Um, Elisa mentioned, of course, um, uh, this, this, this couples therapy, which is kind of a new thing in Norway. Um, I mean, we have uh, a very good cooperation with some uh, trade unions, uh, but we, we're really at the kind of start of the dialogue between oil workers and environmentalists. Uh, but uh, couples therapy seems to be going on for quite a while in the UK. And, and obviously you've written a report, Gabrielle, uh, uh, with um, inputs from uh, offshore workers about their demands for just transition. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that and also your, your reflections on the film and, 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 and how that related to the work that you did on uh, the report, Our Power. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, um, I guess to start with the film, uh, a lot of people have said things that I was already thinking, but um, maybe to just add one extra thing, I think one thing that I like about the film is that it brings Deirdre and other representatives from the oil and gas industry into a position where they're saying the common lies that the industry says in the UK about um, we need more oil and gas exploration in the North Sea to secure our domestic supply and that will somehow benefit us and uh, also that uh, continued extraction in the North Sea benefits the UK economy as if it's going to benefit communities in the UK when well, the film explains a lot better than I do why that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but I just appreciate that because it's very difficult to catch industry representatives in a situation where they are uh, being sort of questioned on those things and in the same room as people who are mm. saying the facts and that's always nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of what we did, um, yeah, we worked for uh, around three years with uh, offshore oil and gas workers. Uh, Jake and I uh, have spent a long time together uh, doing a lot of different things. Um, we never needed therapy though. We always got along, didn't we, Jake? Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we uh, spent a long time talking to oil and gas workers um, all over the Northeast of Scotland and other places where they lived in Northeast England. Um, and it sort of accumulated in, in 10 demands that workers came up with themselves in workshops around what a, a just transition should look like in the UK. And we um, basically went on to survey over a thousand offshore oil and gas workers um, uh, about these demands and, and over 90% of them agreed with them. Um, I can, uh, I'm someone that isn't me can probably share the report in the uh, chat if you if anyone wants to read it, but um, I think without taking up too much time in the introduction, um, yeah, I, I just think that over and over again, when we spoke with workers, we saw the same thing that the film was hinting at, which is that um, the profits extracted from the UK North Sea are not uh, put back into UK communities. And that has been the truth since Thatcherism and that will continue to be the truth 
until we phase out oil and gas and develop a renewables uh, industry that is led by uh, the benefit for people rather than profit. And that is just what we will, yeah, that's just the reality. Um, and then, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about what that looks like in Norway, because obviously it's a quite a different situation when it comes to um, the relationship with the industry, because a lot of workers that we spoke to were um, angry in different ways about the treatment that they've received and, and the treatment that their communities have received by the industry. Yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, and that naturally brings us on to to you, Jake. I mean, obviously, you've had some involvement in the film and and and, and uh, in this in this work. And uh, Gabrielle was mentioning there some of the issues facing the people that you represent. So, very interested to hear your reflections on the film in light of those experiences and and, and some of the key challenges that you're facing in the industry. Yeah, it's a pity we've only got forty-five minutes. Um... Can I just say, Camilla, how lucky you are not to have, not have experienced Mrs Thatcher. Um, I think the key for me about the film is it demonstrates just how how deep-rooted um, oil has become in the culture of, of the UK. And when I talk about the culture, I'm talking about everything from finance through consumer culture, climate debate, political culture, everything. And... Um, I think the messaging for me, and maybe we need a follow-up film, um, is about how we avoid the mistakes of what was done by the ideology of, of Mrs Thatcher and, and, our, and our party, what they did to, to the miners, to workers and, and their communities up and down the country, and and why we must ensure that a transition actually occurs this time around. You know, there was a an MSP recently talked about Scotland but was in a unique situation that had won the 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 um, natural resources lottery twice. Um, we squandered the first one, we must get this one right. And we must get it right. But sadly, I have to say, and I no doubt we'll come on to that as we move through the debate, I fear that all of the errors all of the errors that were, were present back when when Thatcher did what she did and, and how she freed up the industry to do as they pleased um, are reoccurring. You know, when I went into the North Sea in 1980, it was like a wild west. You know, it was it was unregulated, uncontrolled, um, and sadly today in the renewables, I know we're in its relative infancy, but but nevertheless, the sector is very much the same as as what the oil and gas sector was way back then. It's unregulated, largely unregulated. It's it's a free market approach. There's a lack of political direction, and, and all of the faults that were present in the beginning of oil and gas have been played out again, which is why I've got real fears mm. about the idea of a so-called just transition, just transition, and why I was happy to get involved in the film. We've we've got to take this out into the public domain. We've got to have these conversations and find a way through um, to ensure we do achieve a, a just transition. It's very interesting, Jake. You talk about uh, about the way the oil and gas industry is, and the fact that it uh, seems to be similar in the renewable uh, industry, and that's a big discussion here in Norway. I was just wondering if, if one of the Norwegian Norwegian speakers, perhaps uh, Ashla, could just say very, very briefly, because I think for um, a Brit coming to Norway, like I did uh, thirteen years ago, um, you know, we, we've 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 spoken a little bit here about the Norwegian model and, and Norway being very, very different from what was presented in the film. Can you just say very briefly some of the key differences between kind of the, the experience for workers in Norway compared to what was discussed in, in the film, particularly when it comes to kind of wage negotiations, national ownership, the oil fund? Can you can can you and perhaps other Norwegian speakers just very, very briefly, particularly for our British uh, participants, just outline exactly how uh, very, very different the Norwegian model is from what was presented in the film? Yeah, I can try. Uh, first of all, uh, me and Jake are also a long time back, so we've been discussing this for years. Uh, and I think if you see the film, and uh, you saw the film, uh, it's a Scottish film, and uh, it, will be, it would have been very different if it was Scotland and Norway, because they could much more compare what it is. They found, uh, and, and, and that's a big difference. For uh, in Norway, it's, uh, it's the whole land uh, is, uh, is part of the oil and gas industry. And we do it all the way around. And that's very important and very different from the UK side. 
And uh, yes, Equinor is a big partner uh, offshore, but the license is, is also a lot of state is owned by the state, which is not an oil company, but also owner of a lot of licenses on the on that. So the, the state owns more than Equinor and Akerbepe for that instance. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a very big difference. And I think uh, also, uh, well, it wasn't easy in the start. I think we have very clever politicians when when they find the uh, oil and gas on Ecofisk in 69. So there's been a lot of changes. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, the regulation of, of the oil and gas has been very different from the UK. Yes, that was a lot of money, but uh, that was transported uh, uh, to, to London, to the Economic Institute of London. And I don't think uh, the Scottish got uh, their part of it, which Norway in total have. That's a big difference, I think. And, uh, and there is also, a, um, and another uh, big difference, I think, here uh, in our company, in this, which also uh, Jake has mentioned in the in the in the film, is uh, how we do the decommissioning of of uh, uh, the oil and gas pl platform, which is gone, which is now uh, part of that uh, solution, Norwegian solution. They have to do that when they finish, and I have to do it sober rights and do it on the web. And just now, I live here on the west coast. I just saw one of the biggest explosion ever on the, on the west coast some days ago when the platform Guda was uh, decommissioned on Aker Stord uh, some some days ago when they're doing that on on a, on a just a recent way uh, to to decommission an oil platform. So the whole uh, uh, line of it is very 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 different, and I think that will also. Uh, well, there, as I said uh, in, the, in the start here, there's a lot of questions that we haven't been uh, asked in the, in, the, in the film, which, uh, which we have to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this and how do we do it on the right way with a just transition way? And I think, as I said, the biggest difference here is that we are still uh, producing, we are still de uh, developing new uh, fields in Norway, but now most for the gas not uh, not uh, that mm. much in oil anymore because if you produce gas then you have to leave the oil behind that's that's one of the reasons before you use the gas to lift up the oil now you know you produce mm. gas more and oil will will be stay back in the in the in the fields and uh, and uh, well we can go further on that later i hope uh, to discuss uh, the carbon and and how we uh, we can uh, do the ccs and all that but still there is a lot of things going and the biggest difference is that the state is very involved in the production, in in the in the in the economy on it, and how they are gonna uh, find the just transition way to come out of it. Electric electrification of the oil and gas fields, for example, which is very you mentioned listing, which uh, we always hope will be <laughs> a field. Well, I don't <laughs> think you and me that are uh, agree on that, but I think that will be also a part of the just transition. So there's a lot of things to go go further on, and and if you now sure. see what's now. No, I stopped there because there are a lot of. Oh, no, 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 that was, that was very good because uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, CCS, which for those who don't know is carbon capture and storage, which we'll come into a little bit later. But you outlined some of the key differences uh, in terms of the, the 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 Norwegian experience, where the state has had a very very big role from the very start. And we mentioned earlier the ten commandments that were uh, which were uh, adopted by Parliament uh, after oil was found in Norway, which. Uh, insisted on very heavy state ownership, either directly or as partners with foreign companies, and, and that Norwegian state institutions and universities had to be part of the, uh, the, the research and development around the oil and gas industry. But also, uh, of course, um, the, 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 the role of centralized wage negotiations and tripartite cooperation, social dialogue, uh, between the unions and the employers and the government has been a big part of that. And that's a big part, Elisa, of um, the, the new Ten Commandments that you uh, and uh, the uh, the environmentalists and industrial workers in couples therapy uh, developed. Can you just say a little bit about what those ten commandments were? Uh, yeah, so, so, so the ten commandments were uh, developed. Uh, yeah, it was the uh, industrial unions on the one side and the climate uh, youth movement on the other side. And what they are doing, they are like they're speaking to the state they, this is a poster we have of it uh, and it speaks to the state so it's saying that you shall be in a hurry uh, that's the first commandment so it says that so to the state let's see i have it in english here yeah you shall be in a hurry we demand a push for a green industrial development 
So it's like command state now. Uh, and then we go, then we're like, we have um, um, like talk through every one of the commandments and come to common ground. Uh, and it's, it, uh, right, it goes from like, what is green industry? What is greenwashing to also how is the green industry have to create uh, uh, good jobs throughout the whole country uh, and um, also respect like the sustainability um, and nature. Uh, and then it also goes into that our let our let your oil policy secure future green industrial jobs. So it also says that your oil policy and how you uh, are developing the oil policies uh, is have to give um, uh, what's it called that it's uh, it has to ensure the level of investment in the green industry as well. So that was like a big part of coming finding a common ground on that. But we are saying. <laughs> Do not stop the oil. We're saying, like uh, they come. The common ground was, um, you have to build it on the shoulder of the old. Yes, of course. And that should and, and how how does this? Uh, sorry to cut, to cut you off, Lisa. How does this compare to the the kind of ten demands that you made, uh, Gabrielle, in the our power report? I mean, in no way the, the kind of role of the state is almost uh, assumed. Although we've had our uh, not quite our Thatchers, maybe, but more more of our kind of Tony Blairs here. But um, but uh, but what what was what was the kind of how does that compare to to the discussions you had with particularly oil workers around the the, the demands that you developed in that report? Um, yeah. So I think <laughs> yeah. There's there's differences and there's similarities because obviously um, yeah, it's it's building off of the things that, like the three sort of sections of demands that we, uh, that the workers built and, and we wrote were uh, uh, our transition, our rights and our energy. And so the, our transition ones are kind of focused on support throughout the transition, uh, what uh, clear and accessible pathways out of carbon jobs look like, high, high carbon jobs look like, and, and sort of what, um, uh, what domestic manufacturing could look like in the UK if it was scaled up um, in the way that we need to see it scaled up. And then the, the right section is obviously more focused on how to ensure collective bargaining and a wage floor across the UK continental shelf. Um, and obviously whistleblowing procedures, um, that are, uh, safe and effective. And then the, um, our, our energy section is, is about public ownership and, uh, communities not being left behind. Um, and obviously a, a different tax system than the one we see now. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if uh, you want me to go into any of them specifically, but I can. No, I mean, it, 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 put, it certainly sounds a lot more like the Norwegian system in terms of, uh, you know, Norway has, has always had a windfall tax on oil and gas. And, uh, sure. A lot of that money goes into the the infamous oil fund, which is a sovereign wealth fund here in Norway, which last I checked, I think has 12 trillion krona. Um, so not doing yeah. too badly. Um, but it sounds a lot as well, the kind of wage negotiations and collective bargaining, a lot like the Norwegian model, which um, which is interesting because we always talk in Norway about the Norwegian model being uh, kind of under attack. And I suppose from a, if, if I was to speak from an environmentalist, yeah. sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I was just going to respond to that by, I mean, do you want to finish that sentence? Because it might be relevant. No, no, I was, I was done, please. Um, yeah, I think, I think we had to be very careful when we were having these conversations to make sure that what we weren't suggesting was um, a oil and gas industry that is nationalized, where the economic recovery that we do uh, goes to the state. Like, that's not... Um, the answer to the problem, because um, obviously, like people have hinted at already, a lot of exploration in Norway is determined around profit making capability, not actual benefit for people and planet like over the long term. And so um, there's a lot of things around uh, protections for workers and and um, like, I guess, standard of living generally, and that that you can glean from the Norwegian model that are like important things in the UK where those 
basic necessities aren't met for a lot of people. Like we have, mm. uh, you know, over a million children who have had their heat or hot water cut off uh, in the first part of this year. Like we, we are failing mm. to provide basic state necessities to people. But I think beyond that, I mean, Norway and the UK are both um, incredibly high income countries with uh, like large historical responsibility for climate change and need to move faster than than any other countries in the global south and and need to to phase out quickly um and stop making excuses around profit as the reason why they don't have to do that either private profit in the uk or profit to the state uh in norway and so but yeah you make an excellent point there gabriel sorry to sorry to cut you off but you, you make a, an excellent point which is that uh from from our point of view in in, in friends of the earth and so forth in Norway, um, you know, some of my colleagues uh, um, who um, are less experienced with Thatcherism <laughs> than me, to put it like that, uh, might be more sceptical to the state, given that the, the role of the state here in Norway hasn't guaranteed necessarily um, that uh, uh, we have a, a, an oil policy that is aligned with, with, with climate uh, issues. And I just wanted to kind of bring uh, Camilla in on, on that issue. I mean, what what you have experiences from from all over the world and, and Norway is, is something of an exception when it comes uh to to the way the oil industry has been managed i mean what would you what would your response be to this discussion about state ownership versus private ownership and uh and those issues i mean what, what would you say to my <laughs> colleagues who in norway who, who uh despite having lived and been, grown up in norway and, and, and used to the state's role don't necessarily see the state as, as an, an actor that can secure uh, or public ownership as, as, as something that can secure uh, climate justice? Cool. But, um, I think if, if I can be a bit kind of exaggerate a bit here, I think the, the success in social and economic benefits from oil has been a hinder to effective transition because most Norwegian literally like it. We're happy with it. And, and that goes, I mean, if you look at, at numbers, Norwegian democracy wants more oil production. Sure. So, 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 so there is obviously a, a tension and a difficulty in relating to, to how then do we leave something that has benefited us to, to consider climate? I think that's that's and maybe that's one of the if I could be critical to the the film, I think the what is not sufficiently mentioned is that when we went from something else into oil, we went from something with lower profit, less efficiency into oil. Now we're moving away from something that is still profitable still efficient and asking to move over to something that is less efficient when it comes to energy and less profitable. And that means it will cost. And there are still yeah, exactly. questions mm. on, there are benefits and costs and there are ways of getting around some of the worst um, costs around it. and. So I, I think that's one of the conversations that we need to be honest about and put on the table sure. because otherwise it, it, it will feel wrong. And I think that is also a lot of oil workers will say, so what are you talking about? We're bringing kind of the welfare state. So, and you're asking us to shut down for what? And if we then can't say, well, the alternative here is less profitable, they won't believe the environmental movement or anyone asking for for a transition so I, th I think that's very very important but but the and i think secondly this idea of the norwegian uh, th there are also cracks and, and challenges in the uh, as you mentioned briefly when we just to mention because on the one hand, we can see that the unions have ensured that in the main agreements, we have central agreements, and in most of the main agreements, the unions have ensured that climate and external environment should be part of the co-determination mm. system from the top to 
the workplace level. So there is a push from the unions somehow to do this. In practice, it doesn't necessarily happen. So we see that both uh, th there are there's a kind of central push to engage with climate change, but not necessarily uh, trickle down <laughs> within the union movement. And 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 we can ask: Did did the does the Norwegian model? Is it rigged to engage with and include challenges from climate change that has all these kind of different interests to, to consider, which is a big question. And just on a, on a note to, to uh, the welfare and everything fantastic in Norway, there are also concerns among the oil workers themselves that especially Absolutely. after 2015, mm. when a lot of people lost their jobs, they were rehired on worse conditions. And mm. when the oil workers we have talked to, we have talked, me and my colleague uh, David has talked to oil workers from five different unions, including Industry Energy. Uh, and we always started talking about their association with transition. Not necessarily green transition, but transition itself. Mm. And to an oil worker, that means worsened conditions, lost jobs, and pressure on labor rights. So, so the green transition is coming on top of, of these processes. And as much as the, the full-time permanent employees offshore with a great job, is relatively privileged in the Norwegian context. There is this processes on on uh, on certain groups within the oil too that feels that the the working relations with the employers is worsened, the co-determination mm. at work is being challenged, and mm. someone's asking to move into the green industry, and there are no actual jobs over there. And the fear is that yeah. all new jobs are, like Jake also said, Thatcher jobs and more liberal jobs and cowboy jobs. N new jobs are not ne not very often good jobs. So, uh, so the question is, exactly. And I think in the film, they... how do we get into? Yeah, yeah. They bring they bring up at the end of the film, you know, the, the fear of the transition as well, and the fear of changing. And I, I think uh, the, the the issues brought up in the film about cost cutting and. Uh, cost pressure in the oil industry. Obviously, Norway is not immune to. I definitely don't want us here to present Norway as this this complete exception for the all the rules of the game. Um, before I ask some further questions, we have uh, some questions from the chat. Uh, so I'm just going to pass over to Maya to uh, relay uh, a question about uh, Rosebank, I believe, from a, a video made by Shetlanders with a message to Norway. Um, yeah, we have one question asking if um, if you've seen a film, a short film made by uh, people in Shetland called A Message to Norway. Um, and in case you haven't seen it, I'll just give a brief summary. So this is a short film made by campaigners in Shetland titled Dear Norway, and um, it urges uh, their siblings across the sea to do the right thing and leave the oil in the ground in reference to um, the Rosebank. Um, oil field, which, as we know, has been approved uh, recently for exploitation. Um, so, yes, what are your thoughts on this video, if you have seen it? And um, what, what was Norway's response, if it's been seen in Norway? Is there anybody who'd like to come in from the panel on that? I think also the question relates to an issue that I really wanted to get into on the panel, though. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure we'll have time, which is, of course, that uh, Rosebank, for those who don't know, is a field where Equinor is the uh, primary owner. Uh, and of course, Equinor is not just Norway's, uh, or is, is not just a, an oil company in Norway, it's, it's Norway's state oil company, but it's present all over the world and in some quite controversial projects. Um, so I don't know if there's anyone in the panel who'd like to just come in on Rosebank and, the, and this film. Don't necessarily want to pick on anyone. I mean, I suppose, uh, Jake, if I can bring you in, um, obviously you're not in Norway to react to this, but from your perspective, um, what 
how how is the Rosebank issue kind of seen from oil workers' perspective? Uh, how is Equinor seen uh, from kind of perspective of, of British workers? Yeah, a nice easy question to try and finish off on. Yeah, um, I think as we've said, Gabby and I in the last few years, but we've got the same common. Um, outcome you know we've got the same ultimate goal um to stop burning oil and and decarbonize the world and and save the planet that's that's a given how we do it and, and how we do the transition is is the key and you know I, I would completely disagree with some of the comments made as gabby's already alluded to today about the the need to exploit oil for the security of energy supply and everything else it's, it's utter nonsense but I don't think it's as simple as simply saying, do we support new licenses or not? I think you've, you've got to look at the bigger picture. And I think the, the film illustrated how, as I said earlier, how deeply entrenched oil is in, in the culture and everything we do. You know, I mean, it, it, as the film features, it, it is virtually, oil is there virtually in everything that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So, we're not going to be able to eliminate the use of oil necessarily. Uh, we should absolutely eliminate the burning of it, but oil in itself um, is going to be critical for some years to come. And so the question then is, do we use our own domestic oil to to do the, the manufacturing stuff and the, the petrochemical the, the chemical stuff? You know, considering that we in the UK, 80% of homes, unlike Norway, 80% of homes are heated by gas, you know what I mean? So it's not going to be mm. a quick change over. It's not going to be rapid. So we've got to manage it. And if we're not going to use or exploit domestic produce, are we going to import it from, I don't know, the mangrove forests of Nigeria or the, the rainforests of South America? I don't know. Um, but I do believe there's a need for greater control. I think there's a good, uh, we should be a bit more pragmatic and look at the whole licensing piece. I think we should allow potentially at least and i'm throwing this out there for debate um potentially licenses where electrification can be can be achieved of operations and decarbonizing the operation at source and in return um almost new for old get rid of the old co2 polluting dirty old platform shutting them down and, and decommission them properly and clean up clean up the mess and that again transitions us away from dirty production, dirty oil, carbon-free production and and use of our domestic product. And I know, as, as the film said, a lot of it is, is exported out, but at the same time we export as much back in and it's in a different form, simply because of the, the refining piece. So that's probably no answering your question, but I think there's a broader discussion to be had there um, about the whole licensing piece. And I'm sure Gabby will have a few views on that, but um, I'll leave it there. Well, I mean, just just on your point about trans a, a transition and electrification. For those who don't know, electrification refers to using uh, electricity from the grid to power oil and gas platforms, uh, rather than gas turbines, primarily on a, a oil and gas platform, thus uh, potentially committing uh, reducing the emissions. If the renewable energy, if it's renewable energy that powers the grid. Uh, that's a big discussion in in uh, Norway. Uh, Ashla, you, you mentioned it uh, in your introduction. Uh, you know, when Jake talks about a transition, I mentioned the report from the, the obviously ELO, the, the Confederation of Trade Unions themselves commissioned, which showed that we lack 100,000 jobs uh, in uh, green industries. And, and, and part of the conclusions of that was that the oil and gas sector is still uh, so lucrative and the wages are so good. And, you know, the recruiters from oil and gas go into universities and get all the best people. There just isn't the, 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 the labour. Uh, and, and skills uh, available to green industries to transition. And from our point of view as the environmental movement, electrification, uh, which is very, very expensive potentially, also kind of locks us into oil and gas when we, we want to be kind of shifting things over to, to kind of green industries. I mean, what, what is your view on, on how we have a kind of proper transition rather than kind of two parallel tracks of a kind of continued oil and gas and some green investments here? I was just wondering what your, your thoughts on that were, Ashla. And then I'll come back to Jake, because I can see he's got his hand up. Well, 
first of all, Rosemont, uh, I haven't seen the films. I've seen uh, the news and I've seen a lot of protest actions, of course, in Shetland and in, in the news and all that. But I haven't seen these films uh, and I shall do that. But still, uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm agree with, uh, with Jake. Uh, because I don't think uh, if uh, it's Equinor uh, is uh, is developed the field, or I think that's better than a lot of others because there is a lot of possibilities to have influence on that company more than uh, a lot of other companies doing the same thing. So, so I think that's 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 kind of a good thing. That's possible to do. Just uh, two days ago, I had a long discussion with the British uh, unions that have made an agreement with the Equinor now. Uh, for for the the the, um, the mariner field, they have struggled for a long time, and now they have made an agreement setting up in the, uh, there. So so Equinor is one of the companies that have some open doors for British unions, for example. That's one of the good things, and I think they can use their experience uh, for uh, for uh, using uh, electric electrification of, of the, the field and also the CCS product. If you have been on the Sleipner field, which I have been and seen the green pipe going down there and they are storing the carbon for, for many, many, many years, decades. So I think there's possibility to do it. I don't have the answers, but I think if someone should do it, I don't, I think Equinor is one of the best to do that in, in the right way. That's my point of that. But there is a lot of things around this uh, development. I, I, and I, there's a lot of people working like we know, on the just transition every, every day. The problem is, and, and one of the biggest uh, news in Norway today is that, for example, offshore wind, which uh, is one of these things that can uh, be part of the electrification of, of the, the oil fields and bring in uh, energy to, to shore and uh, on, on the long term make a green hydrogen of, of wind, which is also a part of it, is, uh, is Norway is way back. So I'm very agree with Camilla. I don't think, think that the, the Norwegian system is made for, and we're, we're laid back and, and not ready for the, 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 the just transition the way we should have been. And there is a big work to do that with the company, with the oil workers, with the government, with the, with the, with the associations and all that to do this. And, and we are uh, staying behind. And one of the biggest problems on that is the state has controlled the, the, the Norwegian field, the Norwegian sector, taking control over the regulations and the environment uh, situation on it. And that's for that, therefore, the biggest uh, offshore wind system and, and companies are going out of the Norwegian sector. And the three mm. biggest is in the world uh, in, in offshore wind is, is uh, Equinor, it's Ørsted and it's Vattenfall, three Scandinavian government owned companies. And, and they are what they won't do it in, 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 in Scandinavia. They have developed the offshore wind system in a other political system that is easier to have regulation and, and, and use uh, cheaper labor in, in US, in, in UK. <laughs> Uh, for example, and, and that's mm. that's one of the things we now see that they are running away for good regulation to develop that kind of green energy other ways, other places. And I'm sorry to say that. And and, and the state owned company is part of that. Ørsted is claiming yeah. very bad, which is a state owned company of Denmark, uh, and is, is one of the biggest on offshore wind, for example. So we have to mm. push them back take control over this company again and that's we are working together with rmt and unite and danish metal and all these other unions just on that gonna have a big uh, discussion on that in in norway where equinor will be present to discuss this in in the end of this month very interesting jake do you want to just uh, come in with your point y yeah thanks oh, no, i was just to make the point on uh, go back to the licensing thing that you know if, if we stop licensing here if we stop oil and gas production here that will be done elsewhere and and i think there's again if, if we were being pragmatic about how we do it we could be the model for for other states or other countries i mean i did a video just three weeks ago um for a research group who are looking at the development the commencement of development of oil and gas off guyana they're just about to start the oil and gas process 
and they're going to be doing it in a very dirty, environmentally damaging way. We, we, UK and Norway are the most regulated, controlled, environmentally and health and safety wise, on the planet, and and we could demonstrate to other states, different countries, how it potentially could be controlled, but at the same time show them how we can tra transition to renewables. And I think that that's for me the, the key in the whole debate around more or, or less, because this is a global climate issue. You know, stopping production in North Sea is not going to change the climate situation by any more than about 2%. Um, so I think there's a broader discussion to be had on the, on the whole licensing piece. That's, that's the point I was going to make. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, uh, the, the response, <laughs> I suppose, would be that we have to start somewhere. And I think we've got a question in the chat related to kind of how, how serious the situation is now uh, when it comes to the 1.5 degree uh, target. Amaya, if you can just uh, give us that question from the chat. Yes, so the chat is asking, what is the panel's reaction to this evening's announcement from the science sector that we are going to reach 1.5 degrees much sooner than first predicted? Yeah, perhaps um, we can go to uh, Gabrielle on that to start with. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think, okay. I'd written down a couple of notes on Rosebank, but I understand that this isn't a panel about Rosebank, so I won't get stuck on it forever. But I think like it's, there's just a few things that are important to keep in mind when we're talking about developing Rosebank because, uh, you know, uh, Equinor announced quarterly profits of 6.6 .6 billion. Uh, they made 22 billion in profits in, 20, uh, in 2023 so far. Um, like we're talking about a uh, energy company that is making an oil and gas company that's making huge profits from this uh, expedition into uh, the UK North Sea with the UK because of loopholes in the windfall tax covering 91% of the cost of developing Rosebank. So our tax dollars are going towards Equinor making huge profits. That is the structure of Rosebank as it currently stands. And so uh, while yeah and i think the other the other thing is just there's quite a big difference between the emissions reductions of electrifying a platform and the emissions that are released through the burning of the gas those are two very different levels of emissions that we're talking about but i think when it comes to the announcement about 1.5 like we just need to we i think that the conversations that we have about rosebank and the conversations that we have about these different things are all sort of predicated on the idea that our governments are transitioning. And so uh, let's talk about like how to best do it and what order to do it in and all those things. But like the reality of the situation is that our prime minister in the UK, at least, Sunak rolled back a bunch of climate commitments. He rolled back commitments to, to uh, ban the sale of new diesel and petrol calls, cars. He rolled back commitments to uh, ban gas boilers. And so we are not transitioning currently in the UK. We don't have a government in power that is committed to transitioning away from oil and gas. And so like uh, the and that is why Jake and I get along at the end of the day, because we both understand that, like, while we might disagree about who should manage the transition and what country should transition first and those things, the relevant part and the thing that we need to remember is that we are fighting people in power in governments in the global north that are refusing to recognize that they are driving the world to disaster and and they are not uh, moving and so it, it's sort of irrelevant the specifics like the the problem is that the enemy is clear and they are not doing anything and that's what the 1.5 yeah. illustrates yeah, and I think uh, we, we, we're kind of, uh, we're already a little bit over time, we're, we're running out of time. So I think uh, just a final question to the to the other panellists. I mean, uh, Gabrielle said herself, you know, there's some disagreements as we've seen from the panel here, but, but they do get on because they have a kind of common vision and we're here talking tonight. So so that's something. What are the what are the next steps after the oil and gas industry? So what are the next steps for, for us to carry on these conversations between um, between the uh, green and labour movements about a just transition, w w what would what would be the most important thing kind of going forward? And I'll go to um, Elisa 
or her uh, thoughts on that to start with? Yeah. Very briefly as well, because yeah. we'll come to a Very briefly. close. Okay. Okay. So I think to to absolutely find uh, still finding common ground, finding which issues we actually can do, we can actually uh, where we can achieve something. So we find some um, uh, momentum around the issues where we feel that here we actually can <laughs> get a change. I think that's important. And then I think it's the building of the trust between the movements. So that because in the social movement, it's I think that uh, the climate movement can represent um, the climate and the labor movement should represent the unions and the workplace and the, also the, the welfare state in some ways. And if we can see, if we can have that division of of representing different interests, but at the same time trusting each other, I think that's a very important um, part of actually coming together and finding common ground also. So, yeah, have a fundamental trust. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's very good. Okay. Very good point, Lisa. Uh, Ashla, how would you how would you suggest we go about building that trust in, in Norway? I think, uh, first of all, they have to uh, push the government uh, on more uh, uh, pressure so they can uh, do, get speed on the, the CCS which I think is a way to go. And to do that, we have to have the cost of carbon leak. It's, it's, the, it's the big issue. It's too cheap today to, to, to leak out carbon and CO2 to the atmosphere. So we have the cost of that is very important. And then I think if this cost, then you get all this uh, good engineers and professors and all that's working on it. And I will find the solution to do that much cheaper than today. And then it uh, will be work. And then you have to use uh, the, the, the hydrogen start with the, the blue and then turn over to green and i'm totally sure of bringing uh, wind in as a big issue and the transfer to to green uh, uh, hydrogen look what they're doing in germany now i think that's the way to change it but it had to be carbon free and and that's the only way to do it and i have to find the solution on that and the only ones who can do that is the engineers working on the problem today and the cost of it then they have to be more setting in it so that's the way i think we can go forward Thank you, Ashla. Camilla, your thoughts on how we can go forward? Thanks. Um, I think in the Norwegian experience, I think there has been a lot of movement when it comes to conversations between labor and the environment uh, in many ways. Um, but I think like, like uh, Jake and Asla talks about labor is talking across countries. And I think not only comparing countries and saying like like you you mentioned uh, the the question of of uh, who should shut down first i think that's not a very good question and that is also inspired by my friend who's the climate advisor to the nigerian labor congress she says that's not a very good question because we have to start from a point where we know that everyone has to transition mm -hmm. the question is how so I think we need to move over to the how and not who. And I think that conversation needs to be cross country more than it is today. Yeah. Jake, your thoughts on that as a, as somebody who's, who's already working on this uh, cross country, so to speak. Yeah, I think, I think Camilla summed it up about when she was talking about Norway, the sense of democratic control and, and, and national benefit. I think for me, I did an event on, on Friday, actually, and, and it was a very good publication released as a consequence of that bit, that, um, that event. Um, we need to broaden the conversation out to, to explain to the, the citizens of the state, and we're all citizens, whether we're climate activists or, or workers in the, in the oil and gas sector, um, that there's a different way. There's a there's a different approach that can be adopted. There's a, a, an approach which will address, you know, fuel poverty. It'll, it'll stop pensioners dying in their homes in the UK in the winter. There's a different approach in terms of a benefit and and community benefit, national benefit. There's a different approach for the world. And then touching on the 1.5, that's what 
that's what it's all about at the end of the day. You know, I mean, we can sit here and deliberate as much as we want, but if we don't move it on, then the four grandsons that I've got and, and Asla's got a couple there as well, will be condemning us for, for a lack of movement on it. So we've got to get it moved on um, at a democratic level of workers, climate activists coming together as citizens of the world to get this sorted out. So keep the conversations going and get them get them organised wherever you are in, in the labour and, and climate movement. And that's a very good way to finish because uh, Amaya is going to tell us a little bit more about how we can carry on the conversation uh, in terms of being able to come along to more film screenings and panel discussions coming up in Norway soon and how you can host events yourself. So Amaya, if you could just uh, tell our audience a little bit more about that. Yes, definitely. So we are very excited to present the film uh, to Norwegian audiences. And so we have five in-person screening events coming up soon. First one this Friday up to next Tuesday. So we will be stopping in Tromso, Trondheim, Stavanger, Oslo and Bergen. And um, all of these uh, screening uh, events will be followed by a panel discussion with different people from different disciplines, similar to what we had today. Um, so please uh, check our events at the link that you can see. Um, and also, if you're interested in hosting um, any screenings um, free of charge in the UK or Norway, please contact us through our website at uh, www.theoldmachine.org slash host and we will send you the film alongside a promotional kit and a discussion guide to help facilitate conversations after the screening. Brilliant, thank you Amaya and thank you to everybody who's been following uh, for the last uh, couple of hours, both the film and the panel. Thank you so much to all of our panel members for giving their time this evening, it's been a fascinating conversation and I think we probably could have gone on for another 24 hours, but uh, I'll let you go and enjoy uh, the rest of the evening. Um, thank you so, so much as well to the uh, producers of the film and the people who've been working on it, uh, particularly to Ben Kempas uh, and to Amaya, who you've heard from. Uh, I really hope this film can be uh, a great start for lots of conversations in both Britain and in Norway. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you who've been here tonight at the, the so-called physical screenings in uh, all of these Norwegian cities over the, the coming uh, week uh, and and by all means uh, organize an event and screening. Uh, it's a great opportunity that we, uh, the, the producers have given us this film to be able to use in a way to spark these discussions and I think uh, we can look forward to some really 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 good discussions going forward. So thank you very very much and uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs>